I'll start by uh, introducing Alexander. Actually, Alexander doesn't need a, an introduction. Alexander is a star quant, um, quant of the year, um, according to risk in, uh, has won the most prestigious risk, risk award for quant of the year. And, um, and, and is a head quant in Copenhagen. And we are looking very much looking forward to your, um, what looks like groundbreaking talk. And without further ado, I think there is, I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm just going to let you, let you speak. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, I'm more humble when you presented me. You know, I'm not a head quant here in Copenhagen, but but thank you. <laughs> yeah. So in this presentation, we will talk about uh, neural network, uh, neural networks, uh, you know, and uh, uh, possibility to make an asymptotic control. So as you know, uh, neural network, especially deep network, is a sort of black box, right? So in uh, in, in the bulk in the where the points where we learn the points of this uh, uh, of this interpolator, we we can uh, capture the function quite well. However, uh, outside of this bulk, we don't know we don't know the results, and uh, so we have started this uh, actually this theme approximately one year, a bit more than one year ago, and uh, we concentrated first on the Kolmogorov Arnold theorem, one of the basis is of the uh, neural networks and then uh, we wanted to understand if we can uh, keep uh, if uh, the asymptotics of this function especially multi-dimensional function are somehow encoded inside and we actually didn't didn't find it so in the end of this presentation i will a uh, little bit uh, comment on this so if you have questions uh, do not hesitate yes and if you have questions do not hesitate to interrupt me because we have quite a lot of time today so the, this is joint work with uh, michael konikov and vladimir pisobar so, uh, so introduction introductionary slides uh, this is machine learning or deep learning neural networks and other stuff are becoming a standard piece of uh, kit of the toolkit in the in a, in a bank or in a software organization. Uh, These uh, neural networks have been proposed to, for two reasons. So the first is speed up uh, slow functions, uh, or in other, in other words, to tabulate multidimensional functions. So we calculated, we computed for a different set of parameters, uh, and then we uh, used this neural network to reproduce it. The second one is to calculate conditional expectations. Uh, so you can see the references inside to see uh, to see these uh, approaches. Uh, other applications, of course, are very numerous in, in the tenant. So you can check uh, you can check these references to see what was done. Especially, but you know, especially uh, we can, uh, for example, uh, make. Permit, parameterize uh, regression results, we can parameterize uh, uh, exercise bounds, or a lot of things. Uh, generally, the learning points are concentrated in the main body. Uh, just a second, please. Oh. Uh, concentrated, like this. Concentrated in the main body of the distribution, but not in these tails. So, as I said, the typical neural network fitted to observation extrapolates outside of the learning cloud in completely uncontrolled manner so it goes up and down and so we don't know how it will uh, how it will end and where will be, and where will it will end so our goal here is to incorporate extra information which we have the asymptotics into this neural network construction in order to control extrapolation so we'll uh, we will use this asymptotics and uh, uh, slightly modified uh, neural network. Of course, the reasons for that are numerous. For example, stress testing and uh, uh, model explainability and so on. And for example, one of the live current examples is that now the velocity is high, the deviation is very high. So the old models, old neural network, for example, trained for the calm conditions will not work at all. So they can, uh, this function can be outside of the training uh, region 
which was strained, for example, during 2018 or 17, whatever, when the all was calm. And now it gets into the wild ocean of the high volatility and high volatility. All right, so a uh, little uh, reminder of the neural network. Uh, a neural network is a multidimensional function parameterization. So nothing, nothing more. Uh, such that x is our input, is our argument. It's a multidimensional vector. Uh, it is transformed into, the vect into a vector x1, this one. The transformation is done linearly. So we multiply our dimensional one, multidimensional vector x by the certain matrix w1 and add some vector b1. Then uh, to this linear transform x, we apply some nonlinear function by ele in element-wise manner. So we have here, we have a vector of different size, for, can be different size from x, can be one, two, or whatever, hundred. And then we apply element-wise a certain nonlinear function. One of the, one of the examples is a sigmoid. Then we have our x1 and we do this, uh, we repeat the iteration. So we apply the matrix W2, so this xi, we, have, uh, we add the vector b, and again, apply element-wise the multidimensional function. Of course, this multidimensional function can be different for different types. Then we get this x2 and so on. So we, uh, uh, we proceed with this iteration uh, several times. And, uh, and actually, the, uh, we always choose this linear transformation and nonlinear transformations. Then, at the very end, we collect our function f of theta, where theta is uh, is actually the set of all the parameters w and b. Uh, on uh, machine learning slang, these w's called weights, and the b's are called uh, bars. I just you know the, the names. Um, each line in this scheme is a layer, it's called layer. Uh, each nonlinear function is called activation function. So normally these guys are fixed, so we don't calibrate them. Uh, there are, we can of course, uh, wear some feelings. You know, we can, for example, we can say, okay, for this, uh, uh, for this problem, this activation function can be, I don't know, sigmoids, can be, can be something different. Uh, so people can say, okay, this is option pricing. So the activation function can be, for example, positive part uh, of the X plus, for example, things like this. So there are some feelings, of course, there is, there is no, there is no uh, science, uh, very deep science here. So the adjustable parameters of this neural network are the weights, weight matrices W and the bias vectors B. Uh, we denote the neural network parameterization as uh, theta. So the whole function is uh, f theta of x. So x is our argument, theta is a theta is a parameterization. So theta can be a set of all the uh, weights and uh, biases. Some of them can be fixed, some can be calibratable and so on. So uh, the parameters theta are determined by so-called learning process. So in our old words, it's just optimization. So we say, okay, we have, uh, uh, we have points X of P and Y of P. So X of P is multidimensional, Y of P can be also multidimensional, but here we can say, okay, we, it's just one dimensional. And uh, P, little p goes from one to capital P. So we, have, we can have millions, thousands, points, billions, you know, all the, all the different numbers, different scales. And then we form this, uh, so-called loss function, or in old terms like chi-square, right? And then we optimize, we find parameters theta using nonlinear solver, uh, such that this L of theta is uh, as little as possible. So uh, optimal parameters theta star will minimize this loss function. Again, we can put inside this theta, uh, for example, only Ws, fix and Bs, or vice versa. We can fix uh, some of the uh, layer information and calibrate the other one and so on. So here, big freedom here. This nonlinear optimization is performed numerically. So this is the neural network. 
the node of parameterization is numerically attractive. So as far as apply this, we apply this function, uh, uh, we apply the nonlinear functions uh, element-wise, and as far as the transformation inside is linear, we can calculate uh, replica plated derivatives using AD or backward propagation methods. So backward propagation is a uh, neural network uh, machine learning uh, word for AD, you know, for our quant world. So uh, the resulting F function F of uh, theta approximates a conditional expectation of Y given X. So if the point which we have received in the learning set, so this is the learning set, uh, if we receive these points, which are some functions of X without any noise, then the neural network will approximate the function itself. So easy. Uh, little slide about advantages and drawbacks of this, uh, of, of this whole construction. So advantages is that uh, the neural network in this presentation is highly efficient and customizable. So there are lots of softwares, uh, in, you know, all, all this, almost all of them are packed into Python. So very, very handy. We can uh, uh, calculate everything relatively fast. We can see the results, we can plot them and so on. We have uh, a lot of control here. So free parameters control, we can fix the bias and, uh, uh, and calibrate, uh, calculate weights or vice versa. We can uh, write, uh, overwrite in, uh, in computer language procedures, different layers, write bespoke layers. We can use a GPU, all the whole stuff. So it's very, very practical, easy to apply. Uh, so, you know, a guy from university can do it relatively fast and, you know, and, uh, and uh, immediately uh, solve some you know, problems. The second thing is that neural network uh, is a, a universal approximation. So according to some theorems, whatever function can be approximated like this. So there is a, a theoretical also guarantee of success given sufficient data. So if we don't have sufficient data, then the function uh, maybe can meet the points which we have specified in the learning set, but outside or yeah, well, inside can be quite bad. Uh, then we can uh, talk about drawbacks. So first is uh, numerically solving and learning in a highly multidimensional problem is of course unstable. We have a lot of local minima, overfitting and so on, and it's low of course. So no asymptotics in, uh, Asymptotics are controlled in standard neural networks, so this is our main focus. And um, also we can say that no interpolation control in standard networks. So especially if we have um, deep neural networks or multi-layer neural networks, which is a synonyms, we can uh, potentially observe uh, big holes, for example, between two points. So no one knows what will happen when we have uh, thousands of parameters. They, you know, can go here and there, and uh, so it's quite uh, it's quite scary. So some control would be would be quite quite good. So theoretical basis of, of neural networks, actually two or three theorems. Uh, so the first is a couple of theorems: Sebenko and Hornig. Uh, so this is a theorem, uh, sort of, that any function can be represented as a weighted sum of, uh, uh, of uh, activation functions where, where inside each activation function we have a linear uh, transformation, linear transformation of our variable x. So in fact, it corresponds to one layer neural network. Uh, they have proof that uh, under, you know, if we have sufficient amount of uh, uh, nodes in this uh, neural network, then one, one, one layer of neural network, we can prove, we can prove that the function will converge to, the, to this representation. This is sort of, uh, you know, one of the, one of the simplest example here is Fourier series. So we can say that Fourier series can be also transformed as a, in a neural network such that uh, the first x1 will be exponential of uh, i, I times uh, x times, I don't know what, uh, 
multiply by n1, n2, and, and so on. And then we sum them up and we say, okay, so this is, we know that uh, Fourier can give us uh, the correct uh, under, under, of course, all this condition of convergence and so on, after the infinite number of points and so on and so on. The second theorem is the Kolmogorov or not. Um, and uh, this one also, we can say that this theorem actually give us uh, several, uh, give us hints how to construct several layer networks. So it's not uh, absolutely, you know, in the same terms as we, um, as we specify the neural network, there are some tricks here and there. We can you can you can check it in our in our paper in our system paper here. Maybe if we have time, I can talk about this at the end. It's quite funny and in some sense trivial and <laughs> useless. <laughs> so, so this theorem applied to multi-dimensional problem encoded into some language worth almost nothing. In two uh, words, actually, uh, this is uh, the analog of this uh, theorem is that imagine we have two-dimensional function. So we can say, okay, this is function on the sum, uh, on uh, uh, defined on a, on a matrix. So we don't take all the, all the you know, continuous, uh, uh, continuous two-dimensional uh, plane, but we limit ourselves by, uh, um, by sort of uh, by square by some square, and we say okay, we'll do it in a discrete way, and so we'll come up with a matrix. And then we can, uh, as we all know, we can represent a matrix as a vector, right? So it's like a snake goes like this. And uh, so actually, what we have done, we will represent a two-dimensional plane in one-dimensional plane. So it's more or less like a Kolmogorov or not in multi-dimensions. So if you have a cube, we can go with this snake, you know, so first layer, then cut down and so on. So sort of uh, things like this. But the function which we get, we, I, will, I will show you at the very end, uh, what will, uh, how a smooth and good looking function will be transformed after this, uh, after this uh, snake transformation. So all the information about the function will be so bad, uh, such that it's uh, direct application of Kolmogorov for not has absolutely no use for uh, for some coding for compute applications. Anyway, so uh, our plan will be start with a function f, which would like to approximate. So we suppose which we know some asymptotics in some directions, for example, not not everywhere. It can be it can be partial. Then we find a sort of console varied function such that uh, having the same asymptotics. Then, uh, well, this, uh, this function will be multi dimensional spline which has the same asymptotic function f of x. So, this is one of our technical achievements how to come up with a, a function smooth enough and having a given asymptotics. So, multi dimensional spline. And then we uh, we subtract uh, we subtract uh, from uh, from our from our function f from given function this line. So they have this residue. This residue will have zero asymptotics. And then we will approximate it using a special uh, special neural network layer uh, with zero asymptotics. So that we guarantee the zero asymptotics. So it's easy. But of course, all this uh, all this stuff is inside inside the details. So let us uh, uh, let us remind on one dimensional spline. So the spline or cubic spline is a piecewise piecewise cubic polynomial. So between some nodes, we have some nodes h i. General can be from I don't know, ten, five, uh, hundred, uh, hundred uh, nodes like this. Such that between the nodes, it's a cubic spline. With the four, uh, so it's a cubic function with the four parameters a, b, c, and d, and uh, we require from this plan that the values derivative and the second derivative coincide at the nodes. So we don't we don't want uh, we don't want uh, kings and so on on the on the boundaries of this uh, of this plan. So we require that all is smooth and the second derivative also conserved. So this is almost enough. To fix all these plan coefficients, we have only two extra conditions. So if, if, if you count these conditions, we'll have only two. 
you should uh, fix them somehow. So for example, the class explain uh, has zero second derivatives at the boundary. So it is extrapolated in a linear way. It can be something, some, something different. Um, so this is, this is a plot where we take uh, Black Scholes uh, price dependence on the log of spots. So this uh, orange one, and to approximate it with a spline. So this is blue line is, is, is a spline and uh, yellow stars are nodes. So we see that the outside of the last node, the extrapolation is flat. So there is no, uh, here you see that slight, slight error here also. So the extrapolation is linear like this, and there is of course no control uh, what will happen here. Uh, however, we can uh, try to attach to this one dimensional spline the knowledge of the asymptotics. So if we know the asymptotics, for example, starting from two, we can, uh, we can put it in a such way that the asymptotics are satisfied. And of course, automatically, we hope that uh, even in the, in the area between the last, uh, in the last point and this asymptotic start, we can have a good, uh, a better feature of course than this one. So instead of zero on the second derivative, we can fix the first and the second derivative at boundary points. So this is one of the ways to fix the asymptotics. So suppose which we know the function, which we know this uh, com com complicated function asymptotics analytically. So in general, if we change some parameters to uh, a large number, we can um, do we can write some some formulas. A lot of uh, what, for example, was done in the Saber area, in the whatever, whatever model we take, we can, we can have a synthetic solution for large strikes, for large latitudes, and so on. Uh, so imagine we have this F minus of X, which will be in the left, and F plus of X on the right, starting from uh, X, H, H is zero, which will be our asymptotic starting point, and H n plus one, which will be asymptotic starting point from the right. So in this graph, we'll have this point here. So this will be H n plus one, and uh, minus two will be H zero. So we know asymptotic here and here. So we'd like to incorporate this knowledge into this plan construction. So the recipe is simple. We just add points H zero and H n plus one to supply nodes. And we make sure that this plan will pass through this uh, through their values, and uh, we can also fix its derivatives. So this procedure does not guarantee that the second derivative will fit. Well, can can be, but you know, but there is no uh, we cannot do it for sure. So uh, there is also a possibility to continue second derivative. Namely, we should pick up, we can pick up points between H0 and H1, for example, H1 half, like this land way. And then we can uh, calculate analytically the value at this, uh, this point, such that we can also fit these uh, uh, second derivatives. So this is, according to our experiment, the best one, and help to approximate, uh, helps a lot to approximate the reasonable functions. For example, we have, uh, we have um, our old uh, spline, which was like this. Now we have put the function where the asymptotic starts, this one and that, such that after that we just use the asymptotics. And here we have a very, very good fit with the, with the function itself. Of course, it's not, it's a bit coincident. And here, for example, there is a, there is a spline, there is a cubic, cubic function. Our blood shows is not a cubic function, but locally, you know, we see that the approximation is pretty nice. Uh, if you have questions, do not hesitate again. So in multidimensional setup, we use a tensor product of one of these splines with asymptotic control in each direction where they're available. So you can follow the details in our paper. So this is a bit non-trivial uh, uh, constructions. So maybe, you know, again, the formulas, maybe not 
it's quite, you know, multi-index stuff is not always very, very easy, but uh, this procedure can be implemented uh, easily and, uh, and actually can help, can help a lot with this uh, spline uh, interpolation. So let us, let us take a look, for example, at the, uh, at the, um, at the black shoals for t equals one, for time equals one, and the strike equals 100. So two-dimensional case. So we have log spot and log volatility here. Um, this is our two-dimensional line with asymptotic control. So these uh, little guys here, uh, um, th these dark blue dots, this is the spline nodes. It's two-dimensional, so we have two-dimensional spline node grid. The red ones will be points where the asymptotic starts. And uh, we can glue the asymptotics to the to the e internal spline here in very efficient manner. So you see, uh, it looks pretty nice. And if you uh, if you check uh, the errors with respect to the exact black shoals, we will have, of course, a very good uh, fit inside this grid. Outside, we don't have you know the, there is no guarantee that it will work because it's sort of. Uh, Coincidence again, but here it's quite good, and uh, the errors are pretty small, like minus uh, minus two for the for the level of uh, one thousand. Uh, so this is a spline without uh, spline approximation without the asymptotics. So you can see that uh, the the errors can be really big. You know when we go out of the when we go out of the uh, of the of this value and of course the you can see here little waves and so on so of course it's better to you know to to have this extra information in order to help this plant to fit better everywhere so uh this was about this plan <clears throat> with the asymptotic control which we'll use as a control barrier so we'll uh we get this uh multi-dimensional spline we subtract it from the function, and the residual function will have zero asymptotics. So we'd like to approximate the zero asymptotic using the neural network. Actually, having said that, of course we can we can do this uh, we can do these approximations. We can uh, use the neural network. However, it is also possible. Uh, it is also let, 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 let me talk about this slightly later. So, um, what what can we do? What uh, what kind of um, function uh, can have uh, zero vanishing asymptotics? So, well, we can say that it can be a linear combination of Gaussian belts, right? So, this G is a Gaussian belt such that it is concentrated around its center C. So, this is a sort of a matrix here. So, it is always in the multi-dimensional, in some d-dimensional. Uh, so this is the width of the of the whole bell. This is the center of the bell. So what do we say? All right, uh, as far as our function uh, has zero asymptotics everywhere, we can we can do it with the with the bells of different sizes. So this is the size of the bell. It's a linear combination. So we'll put them here and there, and we'll see that uh, it will give us uh, zero asymptotics. So the numerical solver can, you know, solve, uh, can do the same uh, job as uh, it does in neural network. It will work with the centers and widths in order to match the target values and to guarantee the asymptotics. So in our experiments, we just implemented uh, this uh, layer as a like, handmade layer and uh, it is Pretty fine with the with the whole with the whole terrace structure. So this shows the flexibility of this software, of course. So um, we do not first let us remark we do not let the belts have an arbitrary centers and widths to guarantee zero asymptotic. They should be somehow restricted. So the first idea is of course to use uh, something in spirit of neural network. Uh, use a custom loss function. Which penalize these belts getting out of the of the of our asymptotic way. However, it is not uh, strong enough 
even with the big uh, with the big weights for this uh, for these derivatives, it's not strong enough to to lead them out. According to our experiments, it's better to use a mapping function such as these bell centers uh, and the widths are in, inside the symbolics area. So we have in, in the paper we have all the details. So in a few hundred of nodes for multi-dimensional uh, cases is more than sufficient to get the enough accuracy. Um, let me comment a bit more about these things. So the first, you see that these bells uh, have uh, parameters, centers and width, which are in the same space as, uh, as our axis. So if our axis live in four-dimensional, let's say two-dimensional space, these C's will be also two-dimensional. So this is a, a sort of space uh, parameterization of the whole guys. So we can, for example, instead of working with the belts, we can uh, work with the splines, which also have, uh, which also have the, same, uh, the same properties as here, for example. So we have we have these spline nodes here, and also we can uh, we can require these splines having zero asymptotics. So in the same in the same size in the same sense that we have these splines having given asymptotics, we can make them zero. And in this case, this space will be linear space. So if we fix the nodes of these splines, this space will be linear. So these splines here and their centers are fixed they have uh, it doesn't have uh, the form of gaussian belts right they uh, sort of uh, weigh the belts so if a gaussian bell will go down and just you know finish it to uh, some given distance uh, you know of, of a gaussian decay the spline will go in a small way and will get little waves but it's still it's localized in the sense that it is a uh, we have uh, we can get these bases around each node, so more or less the same thing as as here, but the um, the difference is that here we have centers and widths which are calibratable, and the splines are not. Well, of course they can be calibratable, but you know the the problem will not be linear. So that's the first comment. The second comment is quite interesting. So here you see that uh, our parameters has a clear spatial sense. So if we have, uh, we can, for example, put them to a grid, not the dimensional grid, which is sort of uh, splines with, uh, with a fixed grid and so on. But all of them, you know, have, uh, uh, have this, uh, have this um, space, uh, three dimensional space or four dimensional, depending on the space of the X notion. Now, if you if we take a look at the if we take a look at the known network, so you see uh, you see x for example can be four-dimensional space. Uh, when I with the x two can be two-dimensional. So somehow somehow here we are losing information about the space construction. So they pass through different layers, but we lose this information. So that's. Uh, if, for example, uh, we have uh, uh, if we have a sort of Fourier decomposition, then uh, this sigma will be exponential, and this W will be a matrix, uh, which we will have a number of dimensional corresponding to n times very very long, you know, a very very long uh, set of uh, parameters corresponding to this uh, Fourier decomposition uh, Fourier series points. If we have, uh, instead, if we have like two dimensional guy here, we can uh, reduce this length. We can cut them somehow efficiently cut. And so, uh, and use this uh, neural network with multi layers. So somehow uh, transformation from one layer uh, network where all these vectors, all these weights, for example, A and B has a spatial sense, if we can, you know, pack them in, in this way in the neural network, in the deep neural network with multiple layers. But in this case, we will lose this uh, spatial, uh, spatial notion. And for example, we cannot uh, limit uh, the Gaussian bells or whatever bells by the correct, uh, by the correct values. Okay, so uh, this is uh, all about the theory. Any questions? So we'll, we'll pass to the market experiments.
Okay, so of course, first we, we have to test the Black Scholes function, right? So um, maybe it's not that universal and so on, but you can find these experiments in our paper. Here uh, we present more complicated uh, Saber model, four dimensional. Again, of course, you can find them. You can find uh, all the all the details uh, inside uh, the paper. So uh, slightly modified Saber. So we have the Saber model such that the rate S starts from one, the volatility starts from one, so it's sort of factor, right? And uh, stochastic volatility factor. And we have this little v, and this will have a sense of approximate at the money volatility. So alpha, uh, it's no longer a process uh, going around one, when we multiply by v, which is uh, like 20%, things like this. And this gives us this uh, normalized, slightly normalized saber. Then uh, we concentrate on the option price with a given strike, with some strike. And, uh, and then we fix the time equals to one and start in normal implied volatility uh, on the option, uh, sorry, no, no, log normal implied volatility, that's, that's a little error. Log normal implied volatility. Uh, Implied volatility of four arguments. So the first argument uh, is um, is the uh, volatility itself, this one. Then we have uh, beta, parameter beta of the saber, when we have gamma volatility, volatility, and case drive, right? So we will uh, work with this uh, implied volatility, or log normal. And so to demonstrate the flexibility of our approach, we control asymptotics in some, but not all the dimensions. So we perform two experiments. So first, we control the asymptotics of the volatility and the strike, and uh, the neural network will extrapolate itself beta and gamma. And the second experiment, we will control v, k, and gamma, and beta is out of control. Of course, we can uh, calculate the asymptotics, but it's not maybe very, very interesting just in one point. Well, maybe. So. Uh, we will transform, we transform our parameters v, k, gamma, and beta into Gaussian numbers for simplicity, such that all we, we this map is, is described in the paper, but this z1, z2, z3, and z4 will be normalized values of v, k, and gamma, and beta, such that they live uh, in a range of like minus three, plus three. So the main bulk is minus one, one, and so on. So just to have the same, uh, to map it to the same, uh, to the same uh, value, to the same scale. So again, this Z are standard Gaussian, well standard, they are, we, we simulate them by standard Gaussian, but the notional is normalized uh, values of the, uh, normalized values of the parameters. So we did a little parameter, a little, little parameter transformation to the to the guys uh, having uh, uh, living in the, uh, in the in the space in, in the space from minus three to three. So so first, let us see uh, the bounds. So the learning bound is when we put our point. So it goes from uh, minus one to one. So L L learning is uh, one, right? So we train the train our neural network with simulated values here. The asymptotic bound is from minus one half to one half to one point uh, one point five, right? So it defines a region outside which we use asymptotics. So we use asymptotics at minus one point five and uh, one point five, so the, like this. And then the uh, measurement bound from minus two to two, the long, you know, the, 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 the most, the, the bigger, the bigger interval here, where we uh, measure the errors. So we have uh, three of them. Uh, so this is the learning, uh, learning interval forming in four dimensions and so here uh, asymptotic interval. And then this is the uh, measurement interval. So again, we have taken our parameters, saber parameters, transformed them into uh, into like Gaussian looking uh, variables, 
living from minus three to three, this. And then we have picked uh, different, uh, uh, different uh, learning asymptotes and measurement bounds for the, for the problem. Uh, if, we, uh, if we see this, uh, these normalized parameters will correspond to the following Saber parameters. So the volatility will go from uh, 3% up to 67%, beta from 0 0.2 up to 97, gamma from 30% to 2.4, and strike from one half up to 1.6. Like this. The, you remember that the spot is one. So this is the learning balance. The asymptotic balance are larger. So for example, V goes from 1% to 1.4, two times more. Uh, beta from 0, 0, 001 up to almost 1, gamma from 0, 0.9 to 2.4, and k from 0 0.7 up to 3, so quite large tries. Uh, and the measurement, oops, what is that? And, uh, and the measurement bound is again larger where the strikes goes from zero to 13 and so on. So quite large uh, numbers. Let me see if I can do, 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 can I do it up. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if in the asymptotic spline, we use quite sparse grid of three nodes. So this is our uh, control barrier. Three nodes minus one, zero, and one, like this. And uh, the goal is sparse, of course, but the goal is controlled asymptotics and not necessarily have a close fit inside the learning region. It's already not bad, but uh, there, is a, there is a little, well, there is a sizable, sizable difference between the, the spline and the function itself. So having removed these asymptotics using these uh, splines with, uh, with the corresponding asymptotics, uh, we have uh, our Gaussian Bell network, which we'll call Constraint Radial Layer CRL Neural Network. We train it to the residual. So this guy, we have invented this uh, name, whatever it means. Will abbreviate as CRL, but uh, this is uh, this is uh, our network with uh, with the Gaussian bells. The training set consists of ten thousand standard Gaussian four-dimensional samples. So that is why I was talking about the Gaussians because it's quite uh, it's quite handy to um, to simulate them. But of course, these are parameters. Not there's no no stochastic here. So ten thousand parts in four-dimensional space. Uh, we put them inside the training region. If you remember, it's from minus one to one. So to ensure a high sampling granularity, we force all the points coming here. So if one point going out in Gaussian distribution, which is quite common, we, we you know, we very simulate. So 10,000 points sit inside the appropriate uh, region. Uh, then we train this constraint radial layer using a fit to these uh, values without asymptotics where we remove the um, we remove the asymptotics and it has 300 nodes 300 bells so with 2000.7 parameters to train so quite a lot well it's not it's not that that much with respect to the parameters of the certain networks especially deep ones which can be quite uh, quite uh, quite sizable uh, so for control dimensions, the centers width of this Gaussian belts are inside the bounds. For uncontrolled dimension, we leave them living uh, without any constraints, so the belts can go out. We compare our results with the standard neural network without asymptotic control. So we use a neural network with two hidden sigmoid activation layers. By the way, sigmoid is much better, for, at least for this, uh, for this problem, than the other the other layers we have tried several other ones and it didn't uh, actually the convergence was quite bad it didn't manage to converge however changing into sigmoid suddenly we had quite a very good fit 
And uh, the number of training parameters is approximately with, with very high precision, the same as our network. So we, uh, this is the compare, uh, which guy which we'll compare with. So once our approximation of the implant volatility is learned, we generate a validation sample which covers the larger measurement region from minus three to three to cover all these guys and to check, double check how, how, uh, uh, how it goes with, uh, with this approximation. So our tests show that the control in asymptotics significantly improves the neuronal fit for the cyber implant volatility, uh, naturally. <laughs> We output uh, mean squared errors everywhere. So uh, of the networks, uh, classic one or this uh, modified with respect to the exact solution. We work with log normal volatility of about 20% in the bulk, can be slow, bigger and you know, less, and 800 can be at the edges. So when you know, the saber becomes very big. So a learning error is a mean square error over all learning points in the learning region. A validation error is the mean squared error over all the validation points inside the validation uh, validation region. Inside the, we have we pick up the validation points. It, we can, for example, uh, calculate the error only in the learning asymptotics and measurement regions, just to compare how they go how they go different. So uh, we, we will check model one, model two, model three. So the model one will be our neural network with CIO network where we control volatility strike and ball of ball, three dimensions with the split control. Model two, only two dimensions, volatility and the strike. And model three, this is our baseline uh, standard neural network without any split control. So we have these models and we have these errors here. So this is mean square, mean square errors. So in the, uh, to, to be fair, in the, the learning errors, uh, they coincide with more or less of these three models, right? So we see that uh, uh, the points which we, uh, which, we have, which we had in the learning error, we fit them quite well. So the error here is two basis points for volatilities of 20%, which is fair enough. Um, now, uh, this is the validation error. So we simulate, as I said, simulate different points in the larger region. And we see that the validation error in the whole region of, the, of this learning is uh, very different. So the model one uh, have, uh, uh, have these 75 basis points. Then we have uh, this, uh, this actually takes into account all the regions inside the learning points, outside and up to the minus three, so quite far. Then we have model two without, with less control, with errors bigger, and model three has without control, have 15%, which is quite, quite, quite a lot. Uh, as I said, these validation points, uh, we can have them in learning asymptotics and measurement region, so we can uh, calculate this, uh, uh, these errors uh, in different regions. In learning regions, we see that, the, again, the errors are very similar on plus minus several basis points because we have, uh, because we have uh, um, some Monte Carlo noise, of course. So we have 10,000 points such that, so plus minus several basis points doesn't count. Then we have is asymptotic, uh, asymptotic region. Of course, here, this is the smallest, this is the, the middle, this is the biggest one. And in the measurement, we here you see that, of course, it's very, very far this model three, which is again uh, fair enough because uh, it doesn't have any, any control. Uh, observations. So all three models fit the input equally well, the, and so the validation points again are the same. But model one and model two outperform the model three outside the learning region and model one outperforms model two um, in the again because we have more more control so uh, just to finish it we would like to put some plots here so it is it's quite difficult to plot in financial so we fix two arguments and plot the rest too right so we can see it 
uh, we'll see more graphs, of course, in the uh, in our paper. But even here, let's let's fix beta equals to one half and gamma equals square root of three. Sorry, something. Uh... Oh, well, maybe let's let, let me. Let me comment on this later on. Oops. Right. So, uh, so we have uh, we fix beta and gamma, and uh, uh, we plot a graph of the uh, the money volatility again in this uh, in, in this uh, in this um, parameterization normalization and this try. So we see that the errors are very very small. Right, so it's uh, like uh, ten basis points on this level. So actually, uh, if you, if I would, uh, I, I could turn this graph. We'll see that the, in the learning error there is no error, and so these guys, these guys, actually, uh, this biggest error live between the learning error and the asymptotic error. So here they don't have any control. So it goes as it goes, but but, but again, when when you see this little little scale, you see that it goes quite well. So now um, this is the neural network without as much control. We see that it, you know, sinks down very uh, in, a, in a quite uh, quite significant manner, and the scale here is much bigger than the previous one. So this 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 is the effect of the non-controllable behavior of neural network uh, of the of standard neural networks. Now, uh, to show the effect of the asymptotics control for, for our Gaussian belts, we can say that, okay, what will happen if we have, uh, uh, if we uh, control strike and volatility, but not Q. And so we can plot for some fixed volatility and beta, we can plot gamma and strike. So gamma uh, strike is controlled. So we see that uh, when strike goes like this, we have zero. Uh, we have zero errors. However, if we don't control the gamma, we have these ears. Well, these ears potentially were uh, calculated. Uh, this is kind of shadow of the bells, which were pushed out uh, to minimize uh, to minimize uh, our loss inside this uh, inside this function. So this is the learning area. So to have a better uh, to have a better fit. We pushed uh, the bells were pushed by the solver outside, so we have this uh, uh, this uh, you know big ears such that they uh, they don't we don't we don't give a good, good asymptotic here on the gamma level. So if we impose them, everything will be good like this, and of course the scale will be much much less here. So we we can see here the waves. However, these waves are much smaller than uh, when the ears here. So uh, to conclude this presentation, uh, we can say that while deep or whatever neural networks are good in feeding interpolation, they are not good in extrapolation. Uh, this, uh, of course, has consequences for their usefulness in mathematical finance. So performance regimes. Uh, we cannot see before, like uh, happens all the time, and uh, of course, actually now when the volatility is very high and the market is under stress, so it is uh, make uh, this special. Um, we have well, would like to see would even regulators, for example, would like to see how uh, how stable, how explainable is this neural networks. So uh, our solution is to to control. Uh, is to control at least the asymptotics. By the way, we can also control the interpolation, interpolation quality when we uh, when we reduce the width of Gaussian belt to some number. So, you, for example, it cannot be more than le sorry less than uh, I don't know 0 0.1. Such that you are sure that they will not will not have spikes uh, when we interpolate inside the belt. For example, in our uh, in our experiments, one of the experiments, when we can reduce these Gaussian belts with to the um, to very small, for example, out of control to sort of delta functions, 
you can see uh, you can see that the solver will train try to try to match the loss function this solver uh, can actually narrow little details i said with we'll have some needles so so if you if you if you impose this uh, a minimum width to some reasonable number so this will be our granularity so we cannot get uh, needles uh, less than uh, less than this point so there is also interpolation control so this is all let me let me see if uh, if i can answer if i can answer the questions here Yeah, tuck, tuck, tuck. So the question from Maxime Bergeron: What do you do if the terms for construction uh, in the direction where the solid are not on? Yes, I do uh, natural one-dimensional splines. So you can you can see it in the in our paper. So we uh, we just set the second derivative to zero and so without any any control. It shows zero symbols. Are there an advantage you have in mind using them? Especially in this context, actually no. But this is one of the. It can be. It can be other uh, uh, radial function. But you know, Gaussian Gaussian guys are quite uh, uh, well well located in the space. So it has uh, width. So maybe maybe uh, maybe it's one of the. We didn't actually try something different. It was already good when we when, when we started to do Gaussian. So actually, question is answer is no. Any book reference? Uh, any book reference? Many. Uh, maybe it's something. Uh, uh, maybe it is. Uh, actually, in, in in inside the SSRN paper, we have put a lot of information about the splines in the, in the in the appendix, so you can maybe take a look. Uh, because uh, for me, the best reference on the splines was the numerical recipes. A um, nice book which every quant, uh, which every quant has on his desk. But uh, they do not tell a lot about multi-dimensional splines. In our in our appendix, you can find all this information. So uh, uh, how can we? Uh, well, you can you, you can find this is quite quite interesting. Interesting things. So, how do you apply your method to a function uh, whose asymptotic behavior cannot be well approximated by a cubic spline? Like the exponential question, can you ensure constraints like positivity conditions? Uh, the first thing is that we do not use this spline, cubic spline, as the uh, as uh, the asymptotic. We just we used, of course, the asymptotic itself, uh, go, which goes outside of the asymptotic region. Uh, but spline goes up to this asymptotic. So we use we do use the asymptotic function as far as known as analytical. We're supposedly known as analytical out of this asymptotic point. Uh, the guy who comes will be spline for sure. So in this in, in the in this interval between the end of the learning uh, on the learning interval and the beginning of the asymptotics interval, it will be cubic uh, interpolation. So of course, there is no guarantee that uh, if the initial function had some waves, of course, there is no guarantee that we will um, will hit it. So the but you know it's something. Uh, so imagine we have uh, we have some function uh, here, you know, in the which will calculate in the bulk. And here we have the asymptotic. So we have uh, a hole between these two functions. So what we do, we put here a spline, like a spline bridge, as a smooth, as a, as a smooth uh, function of uh, like a polynomial of the moderate order. So of course, again, this it's sort of no man's land, no control, but it's better than, of course, than <laughs> linear interpolation or whatever. The second thing is a concern to uh, like positivity conditions. For example, you can apply them to the weights. 
to the weights of this uh, of this guy to the lambdas. So again, if uh, if we can. Uh, 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 yeah, so for example, you can parameterize them as uh, exponential of uh, kappa or whatever. So such that the solver will never put them uh, put them negative or kappa square or whatever. So you can you can do it uh, in this uh, in this layer in this uh, handmade layer. Oops, sorry. Uh, lost the chat again uh, ah. so you want to play this game with Bermudian option how does your tensor plan construction work in hundred dimension in hundred dimensional it will maybe not work that good um, you should choose, uh, well, in 100, definitely it will not. In Bermudian's option, uh, well, it's hard, it's very hard to, uh, to learn a function in 100 dimensional. Certain neural network can do it, but uh, given a huge number of parameters, it will be one of interpolation from uh, billions and billions of different interpolation. So to me, it's better to reduce this somehow these uh, dimensions to less, uh, maybe ten dimensions. So I don't know, like five, five main dimensions, and then we can apply this. Uh, when can apply this uh, line tensor product? <coughs> uh, linear combination of Gaussian belts seems analogous to Gaussian kernel regression. It is actually. I was wondering if you consider to apply these corresponding techniques. For example, you're absolutely right. So if you fix the, the belts, uh, the belt centers uh, on some grid, which is the same as uh, uh, fixing the, the spline, uh, fixing the spline nodes, you can you know make this uh, makes it the regression uh, regression linear. So the only things will be coefficients to calculate. Uh, <clears throat> However, of course, uh, if we uh, if we work with very very high dimensional space, if this was hundred dimensional was uh, was mentioned, then the notion of space of space things may maybe not the best in the uh, well best. What I know, and so some some mixture some neural network things which are losing the space the space notions can be maybe applied instead anyway here it's quite hard to comment because in such, such highly dimensional highly dimensional space we need so many points that uh, uh, for example in the bermudian option uh, when we simulated with poor 10,000 or even 30 or 100,000 points it will not cover hundred dimensional space at all so you have mentioned the technique helps with explainability. Can you say more about that? Can we give other examples of the type of problem or technique? I would say the saber problems. So explainability in the sense that uh, if you construct this neural network, first you guarantee the, uh, the asymptotics, and second, if you limit, as I said, the width of these uh, Gaussian belts, you will uh, also can say something about the granularity. So you can explain. Uh, so the, this neural network will not be completely black box, but slightly gray <laughs> with, the, with asymptotics and uh, little control on the little control on the uh, interpolation. Uh, other examples? Wow, it can be. For example, you can use it in the, uh, maybe it's as regressions and again and moderately moderately dimensional space where you do the regressions of uh, some values on the states of the Monte Carlo you can uh, you can apply uh, you can apply these things but again uh, well by regression I mean I don't mean regression I, in calculation of the condition expectation on some uh, simulated values given uh, some simulated states you can do this so 
but other you know whatever whatever function you have if you have a function of again moderate moderate number of dimensions then you can uh, and you know some asymptotics you can actually apply this technique but for example if you if you go with the if you calculate an exposure future price of some cash flows in this in this situation you can uh, have the asymptotics for example if you have a zero bond with the with a longer uh, with a longer maturity you can say okay this guy will be our synthetics so uh, for the hull white or i don't know for shiet model it will be exponential of rates uh, times something so this guy will be bigger so you you will see the asymptotics for example also if you have uh, if you have uh, an option payoff in, inside this inside this bulk then i say okay this is for big strikes it will be linear function of our uh, uh, sorry for big spots it will be linear function for example like this so you can use this uh, uh, you can use this information about the asymptotics in order to calculate by regression or by this uh, minimization of this uh, uh, of the loss function for this neural network or for this uh, of, of, for this plant Uh, some some other questions. Are there, are there any other questions that you can put them in the chat? If there are more questions, you can put them in the chat. I think I think there is a, another question from Maxime Bergeron. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so about the about the Kolmogorov uh, Arnold theorem. So in this in the paper, uh, try to summarize it in the uh, in a half straight way, such that you don't need to dig really into the mathematical details, but uh, it is detailed enough in order to understand. So, for example, if you have if we have a multidimensional function, so let me just make this illustration. So the function is like this, x1, x2, this is, uh, I don't know, I've taken this function, like, you know, x2 divided by y minus x. So this is a function like this, right? So uh, the matrix representation in terms of the vector, so as I mentioned, will be like this. So first we'll go, the snake will go like that, then we come here, here and so on. So we can represent this two dimensional function as a one dimensional function along this little snake, which goes here and there. So the function which will be, uh, which will correspond is this function G with little spacing corresponding to the matrix nodes. So you see that this function is not small at all. This is uh, completely noisy. And uh, information, however, of course, the information about this function is inside. But if we take a look at this function, we don't have absolutely no idea what goes with this, uh, with go, what, what goes with initial two dimensional function. So uh, when we do like that, then we, sh we have this one dimensional function. And we can apply the uh, Sibenka Kornick theorem, Sibenka Kornick theorem. So this g of y will be one dimensional function and we can, we can calculate it, we can expand it in terms of this, uh, in terms of this activation functions and uh, li linearly, uh, linearly shifted uh, variables. Uh, so you see, because the function g is so bad, of course, we will not have like a three or five uh, sigmas here. It will be a huge line. So, uh, so here, when you take a look at this at these nodes, you will see that uh, how can we uh, how can we transform the Kolmogorov node into the sort of uh, uh, three layer network. Uh, another thing is that the Kolmogorov node is not just uh, is not just a matrix representation of a vector. So when we take a function, we do like that. There are some, you know, there 
slightly <laughs> slightly less rough <laughs> science, but the sense of that is more or less like this. So actually, they're saying that uh, we can use this magic representation slightly shifted. So as I said, we have a different. Uh, we can cover our uh, initial function with certain little uh, certain little covering, and then uh, again, this is a theoretical result. The whole function will be sum of this magic representation. So this is the Kamagawa polynomial, and so this function g is this uh, rough, uh, you know, this function like that. It is slightly shifted, so you will see that uh, instead of uh, having just one of them, when we, you know, we, we have uh, m, so m is just two n plus one, two d plus one, so something like that. Any other questions? I was just going to say there have been uh, over a hundred people at the webinar, which is great. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So, um, are, there, are there any questions? And so I think we give it maybe 10 seconds for people to put their question on the chat. And they type fast. They if they can type fast. <laughs> um, so starting now. Five seconds. Okay, so now I'm assuming there are no further questions. Thank you ever so much, Alexander, for um, for doing this webinar and oh, we can see quite a few thank yous on the chat um, and I very much uh, would like to thank you um, for the presentation and we can see that everyone has enjoyed it. Oh, thank you very much for your attention and have a nice, uh, have a nice day.